or comment on any part of the program that you find interesting. Um, prior to today's meeting, you should have received a link to our Champions landing page, which includes today's agenda and other materials and reports that will be referenced in today's program. This page also includes materials that we suggest you familiarize yourself with to gain a better understanding of economic development in the region, including a glossary of terms. Uh, we'll drop this link in the chat so that it's readily available to you during the program in just a moment. Finally, all of the registered attendees for today's meeting will receive a link to watch the recording of today's presentation after the program. So without further ado, I'd like to begin today's program and I'd, uh, it's my pleasure to hand it over to City of Davis Mayor Gloria Partida to provide opening remarks. Gloria, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor. And look at that, I remember to unmute. How do you like that? Off to a good start. Uh, good morning and thank you all for joining us today. Uh, for today's uh, Champions program. Uh, and I want to really thank uh, GSEC for putting this together. Um, so uh, before I became mayor, I worked on the UC Davis campus for over 30 years as a lab manager. And that experience really taught me that ideas, discovery and progress depend on local, regional and global networking. The city of Davis values its relationship with GSEC because now more than ever, economic resilience depends on regional interconnectedness. And as, um, as cities emerge from this unprecedented period of economic downturn, I think that cities will uh, need to be able to hit the ground running. And GSEC continues to position our region to benefit from innovation, collaboration, and talent mining. So, so that as we begin to open up, uh, we will be in the best place to rapidly return to thriving communities. And I think that that is uh, just really important. So during today's program, GSEC will provide an overview of Greater Sacramento's value propositions, the pillars of economic development, uh, key regional initiatives, and more. This session is designed to provide you with an understanding of the work being done in our region and the tools needed to champion economic growth, not only in your community, but for the entire region. Uh, there will be breakout sessions later uh, to provide opportunity for more engagement. Uh, but if you have questions during the program, we encourage you to use the chat function as was mentioned uh, earlier. Now, without further delay, I'd like to pass it over to Scott Powell, Senior Vice President at GSEC. And thank you again for uh, letting me speak now. Mayor, thank you very much. And thank you again to the, all the attendees uh, for joining us uh, on this uh, beautiful uh, you know, Friday morning. So uh, going to give you kind of a, uh, you know, kind of an overview of what economic development is and why it's important. And then, uh, you know, then we'll pass it on to the CEO. So, um, We've got a definition up, up on the screen for you as well. And uh, my four years of uh, teaching at a community college, you know, you learn pretty quickly not to read, uh, you know, not to read everybody the slides, but really the focus on economic development is the, uh, is the effort to, uh, you know, grow income, wealth, and prosperity in the region so that uh, every citizen, uh, regardless of, uh, you know, background, can enjoy the, uh, you know, the fruits and benefits, you know, of that growth and opportunity. So, you know, communities were always created for two reasons, and uh, it was for the economy and for protection. And so really the focus of economic development is to grow that commerce and that, you know, and the economy to promote well-being for all of its residents. Um, so really, how do we wind up doing that? And where does a regional economy come from? So somebody to mute here. All right, I think we figured that one out. So if you know, so really a regional economy comes from, uh, you know, from four, uh, you know, from four areas. And, um, you know, it really, you know, it boils down to really two areas. So increase of the company activity and increase in, uh, you know, human capital. So really the, uh, the of individuals, when I say human capital, of talking about people and their abilities. So on the, uh, on the company side of the equation, new companies coming in or companies expanding. So having a diverse set of real estate offerings like Aggie Square or a company like Centene uh, HealthNet coming in and building uh, you know, a million square feet of uh, office space in the area 
you know, adds to that economic vitality. It's companies coming in, they're uh, investing in the region and they're hiring people. The other way a company adds to the economic vitality of a region is through technological advancement. So taking a pro, you know, a production and, uh, you know, or some sort of, uh, some sort of activity and making it more efficient, delivering a good or a service that either creates a higher value or does so in a cheaper, more efficient way. And then on the human capital side, so uh, workers becoming more skilled. This is why universities and colleges are so important because it increases that working ca that capital of the individual. So they're more productive uh, and they uh, you know provide a you know higher value of work. And then just growing the actual you know, number of people in a region. So if I was going to have you pay attention to only one slide, first off, you're missing a great presentation. But uh, second, this would be the one, this really defines what an economy is. Um, I'm sure some of you will hear the economy, just start thinking back to uh, economics 101 in high school and college. And if it wasn't your cup of tea, it's like, I don't know why I'm here. But really, there are four major underpinnings. We're not going to be talking about supply and demand and growth curves, but really looking at companies and their activity of uh, the new ones coming in, them being more productive, the workforce uh, being higher, you know, increasing their skill sets. And Barry, I'll talk to you a little bit more about an activity we took here at Greater Sacramento, our digital upskill, you know, in the uh, second part of our program, and just bringing in more people as well. So those are really those four big underpinnings. And everything I'm going to talk about is going to tie back to one of these four or multiple parts of these four things that drive the local economy. So on the next slide, um, you know, one thing to keep in mind as well is, you know, the entire economy is interconnected. Our region, you know, rarely does one community see more than 25% of its people live and work in, uh, in one community. So, uh, so we had the mayor Davis kicking it off and you can see on the slide here, only about 23, 24% of her residents live and work is me being one of her residents and constituents, you know, work in uh, downtown Sacramento. So as I leave, uh, earn my living in great in downtown Sacramento, but I come back and I shop and I recreate in uh, not only Davis, but in multiple communities of the area. So recognizing that we are all interconnected and that no one area is uh, self-sustaining. Economies don't recognize municipal boundaries or borders. Uh, you know, it's really a overall geography in which they interact with. And that's something the Greater Sacramento Economic Council was was founded to create, and it's something we focus very, you know, very, very deliberately on is growing the regional economy so that all of our residents benefit, regardless of where they uh, they choose to live, because they, again, we all move throughout the economy and throughout the region, and that helps it grow and uh, prosper. So in one of the areas which I talked about earlier, of, you know, again, educational attainment. So we are very, very fortunate within the greater Sacramento region to have multiple uh, institutions of higher education. So I'm going to focus on two. So, uh, you know, Cal State University Sacramento uh, has seen its graduation rate increase 127% since 2016. Why does that matter? That increases our human, human capital in the region. And again, going back to two or three slides ago, why does that matter? That increases the overall economic activity, which translates into a more robust economy. Um, you know, then you look at, uh, you know, UC Davis, we're only retaining 31% of, uh, you know, UC Davis students. So as we're educating them in the region, they're going off across the state and across the country and really even across the world. You know, they got an amazing education. So the more of those students we retain, the more prosperous we're going to be as a region as they learn and innovate and grow and add to the, uh, you know, the capital that uh, companies are looking for. So graduation you know, graduation rates and student retention rates are super important to growing a uh, to growing an economy, and uh, so when we're looking at those things, that's why you know looking at how our universities are doing, not only what they're teaching, but how many of those students we keep here is you know so important. And then you can see on the next slide, oh, nope, next slide. There we go. Uh, we have three hundred eighty-four thousand students within a hundred miles. Why a hundred miles? Why is that important? Uh, that is what most companies look for when they look at their labor shed of where can they realistically recruit uh, students from when they graduate or looking for internships um, is a realistic uh, labor shed. So that says, you know, if you look at compared to Portland or Austin, and those two cities will become more important here in a minute, you can see that, uh, you know, having that amount of labor shed uh, you know, really matters. And then when you look at Berkeley, UCLA, uh, 
USC and all the other wonderful universities in the state of California that make us so competitive and such a you know best place in the world to grow and to innovate is because we have these great universities. We've invested very, very heavy in that human capital, and that translates into the uh, into uh, you know, companies being you know more productive, more efficient, and uh, you know creates a really important uh, business proposition. Uh, you know, for not only the region, but for the state and for the nation. So, uh, you know, again, these, uh, you know, these demographics matter. So, you know, having a university, if you look at how Pittsburgh is recovered, it has gone through its university system. So not only are you capturing those students like I just talked about, but those companies in the region are, uh, you know, taking advantage of the, uh, you know, of the research and, uh, you know, other wonderful things that these universities are putting out that makes them more efficient, um, you know, which allows them to be more productive, which allows them to grow, which again, grows the regional economy. So going back again to those four pillars, a university supports all four pillars. It helps companies start, it helps companies innovate, it increases human capital, and it gives reasons for people to move into the area. So a strong college and university system is, you know, is at the cornerstone of you know, of any uh, well-functioning, uh, well-functioning regional economy. And it is, you know, again, something that, uh, you know, this region to be really proud of, and you as champions should be aware of, of that not only UC Davis, Sacramento State, but multiple other universities in the area as well, and colleges that are growing and uh, creating a uh, innovative ecosystem for the region. So I want to give you kind of a comparison here among, uh, you know, three different communities and taking you all the way back to 2006. So, you know, I know that feels like a lifetime ago. I mean, honestly, 2009, 19 feels like a lifetime ago. But 2006, we chose this for a very deliberate reason. That was where that was the last full year before the Great Recession. So, you know, nobody was on Facebook or Twitter. MySpace ruled the area. Um, you know, uh, George W. Bush was, uh, you know, people wondering why he was theoretically talking about planning for a pandemic, which, you know, now we realize was, uh, you know, was a thoughtful move. But if looking back at, uh, you know, Sacramento, Austin, and Portland, all right around that 2 million people, Austin was actually looking up at Sacramento and Portland of, uh, you know, not only in jobs, but number of people, you know, and the level of innovation. But as you, you know, fast forward 13, 14 years, you can see Austin has, you know, caught up and passed us in the number of jobs. Portland, you know, has also exceeded it. Um, and that really comes from, you know, you're looking at the companies that kind of underpin each of these regions. So in Austin, you've got uh, Dell Computers who, you know, really helped uh, revelize the PC revolution. And then innovative companies like, you know, Whole Foods and Yeti. I mean, if you look at Yeti, they've convinced people to spend $400 on a cooler. Um, and if that is an innovation, I don't know what is. Um, and then if you look at, uh, you know, uh, Portland headquartered with Nike and Nike is really, you know, really revolutionized that community. And if you look at, you know, Nike making all of its shoes in uh, Asia and sold throughout the world, all the, that income and wealth from all those shoe sales and apparel sales still comes back into that greater Portland area, which supports their economy. And then when you look at, uh, you know, not only is Nike there, but because of Nike's dominance, Companies like Adidas and Under Armour and Columbia, you know, Columbia head, being headquartered there have made that design and apparel um, you know, industry a major driver of that. And then the spinoff effect of all those companies as well has really what's jump-started and kept that Portland economy a humming. If you look at you know, its university sector, fairly weak compared to Sacramento and Texas and Austin, and I'll, arg you know, and I'll argue you know, till the cows come home, that Sacramento pound for pound on a university setting, you know, outweighs these two, you know, these two uh, competitors. Um, but one area we do lack is those innovative companies that are creating spinoffs and new innovations and whatnot is why we partly lagged. And the other thing too is Austin has been very, very deliberate into growing its economy and creating a 21st century economy. And both these areas have been very good at attracting talent from outside the region into the area. So when Michelle is up and speaking after Barry, you'll see you know, some of our efforts on talent attraction and understand why it's so important for us to grow and create such a, uh, a diverse economy. So kind of on the next slide, you'll see kind of how in which the, these compare. And this really goes back to that underpinnings of the economy. Population growth. So again, talking about the human capital. Over that, over that uh, period of time, we've grown 15% 
Austin's grown by almost 50% and then Portland by uh, 19%. And the next couple are really where, you know, they've maintained those competitive advantages. And this is where the Greater Sacramento Economic Council is really focusing on to uh, grow, to help change that trajectory. Uh, so we advance out of this coming recession. You know, Barry talk about, we were the last, uh, the last economy to come out of the Great Recession, and we want to be leading, you know, as we're coming out of this current one, we think we're going to be a leaders. But um, educational attainment, both Austin and Portland, higher educational attainment, and that really translates into the next one, and I'll talk about tradable sectors here in a minute, but both Austin and Portland uh, have, uh, go back real quick, um, you know, have a, uh, what do you call it, uh, you know, much greater competitive advantage here when it comes into tradable sectors. That leading into total growth and regional growth here is, uh, again, why those outpaced. But, it, you know, as we work and grow our economy, I think we'll, we'll uh, be narrowing that gap. And I think uh, when we, you know, we look back in 10 years, you know, we're going to be talking about that great success story of uh, Sacramento, giving all their underpinnings and how we're tying it together that are going to make this, you know, economy a dynamic, you know, dynamic force for the United States. So on the next slide, uh, you know, Brookings, you know, compares a year over year. So looking at these two, we're kind of in the middle of a pack in growth and prosperity. Um, inclusion really goes into wage growth. So we're a little bit ahead of everybody else there, but it really started making pace on racial inclusion. So I think over these next couple areas and some of the efforts we've taken, um, really going to be positioning our region to, uh, I think when we look at this report, 23, 24, 25, you're going to see the greater Sacramento area really narrowing that gap. And, uh, you know, because of the efforts that we've undertaken on focusing on tradable sectors and growing human capital is uh, really going to show that, uh, or you're really going to see they, you know, the, the proofs in the pudding that through these efforts that uh, our region has grown and been successful. But really the area we focus on, and I'm going to take you through these next few slides here is growing tradable industry sectors. So a tradable industry sector, and there are two, let you me know, back up a second, two pieces to a, uh, an economy or to an industry, excuse me. You have tradable and non-tradable sectors. So this isn't one's good, one's bad, but the tradable economy, you know, will grow the non-tradable. So um, tradable industry sectors are those companies like a Nike, a Yeti cooler. So when somebody in Maine spends $400 buying that Yeti, all that wealth goes back into an income, goes back into the Austin economy. So, you know, they tend to pay higher, they tend to bring out, uh, you know, they create higher wages, which then that money circulates through the economy. So these tend to be life science jobs, manufacturing jobs, technology jobs, jobs where the good service or ideas leave the region and then bring back the income that gets circulated through the economy. So for that, they support between two and five additional jobs in the economy. So that's through their supply chain. So, you know, uh, so if a good or service is made, they've usually got to get something that goes into it. And then those employers, you know, I'm seeing those employees also, uh, you know, also go out and go to bars and restaurants, which is the non-tradable sector. So hair salons, uh, you know, restaurants, uh, everything along those lines, healthcare are non-tradable. Very, very important, create a great quality of life. An economy can't function without, a, you know, without the non-tradable side. But if 15 new restaurants open in an area, doesn't mean you've got 50, you know, the economy to support those new 15 restaurants, unless you have strong tradable sectors, you know, jobs to support those. So you bring in 15 life science companies, those will support in, you know, support those restaurants, those bars, whatnot. 15 new restaurants won't support that. So we focus at the Greater Sacramento Economic Council on the tradable sector side, knowing it supports the regional economy as well. So when your constituencies say, I want a new bar, restaurant, dry cleaner, salon, cool place to shop or bookstore, uh, you need those tradable sectors to be able to create the, you know, the customer base for it. And that's why the tradable sector is so important is through that multiplier effect and being able to support it. But uh, again, both support a vibrant economy. We can't have one without the other, but the tradable industry, industry sector will dictate how the non-tradable sector will be supported. So if you want that great downtown, you need great tradable sectors in your, you know, not only in your community, but in your region to, uh, to support them on a go forward basis. So I mentioned this here, so uh, just kind of doing that, you know, so a non-tradable, so usually supports one additional job. So usually their supply chains tend to be fairly shallow and, uh, you know, and a restaurant doesn't support a whole lot more restaurants. 
Um, a hair salon doesn't support in a whole lot of other hair salons. And then, but on a manufacturer, for example, will support uh, multiple others and usually as a deeper supply chain. So there's a lot of things that go into their, you know, into their production. So again, not a value statement, but going to the reason we focus on tradable sector jobs is because of the multiplier effect that support those, those two, three, four, five additional jobs throughout the economy. And that's why that's so important. And through that, um, you know, to have those jobs, again, you need to have educated people um, and, you know, great, uh, you know, uh, tradable sector companies, you know, to make those happen. So, uh, you know, creating a tradable industry sector job, um, you know, you know, really needs a handful of things. So really one thing is, is that, you know, that industry consortium or that they're there, that institution. And again, this goes to back to why universities are so important. Uh, you know, because they really create that intellectual capital that uh, supports, you know, that entire ecosystem. So one example uh, that's, you know, is being created right now and just actually launched here uh, in earnest about two weeks ago is the California Mobility Center. So it's an industry-led model that is going to help bring in, you know, if we'll go to the next slide, you know, tradable sector jobs in the clean tech space which when you think about how you got along, you know, if you thought that you were gonna pay somebody $1.60 to rent somebody else's bike to ride around downtown, people would have thought you were crazy 10, 15 years ago. Now it's a very, very common approach to how to get along. But if you look at, you know, 10 years ago, you know, the thought of an electric, plug in electric vehicle was, you know, something in the future. Now every company is coming out with one. So an industry like the California Mobility Center will help grow and support those in the region which will be the underpinning and base for the, uh, you know, for the entire, you know, for the Sacramento economy and will benefit every community in the region and make this uh, region much more competitive. So when we talk about Sacramento in 10 years or when people in Austin and, uh, you know, Portland do, they'll be talking about, you know, companies we haven't even thought of yet of them being in Sacramento and anchoring this region when we talk about this sector. So something we should all be very excited in regardless of where you are, because not only is this going to, uh, you know, create some great jobs, it's also going to help us, you know, change the economy, you know, address climate change and uh, really put Sacramento on the map as a uh, major industry player. So, uh, you know, as I'm going to you know, start wrapping up this up here, um, you know, talk about the difference between the state, regional and local levels of how they each kind of play into economic development. We each have our own lane but we're all interdependent upon each other, you know, to grow it, you know, to grow the economy, grow the economy and grow the region. So we'll start with the state role and that is led by the uh, governor's office of uh, business and economic development, colloquially referred to as GoBiz. If we go to the next slide, they really set this, the direction for the state. They create the brand, the messaging, you know, for the state as a whole, a lot of companies will first and foremost start at the state level, then look to the regional level, and once they decide on the region, then they'll go down to the local level. So the Greater Sacramento Economics Council in this is, is we build the economy, we set the platform for the region and build that model. We maintain all the analytics, we set that strategic direction, and we kind of become that, that channel not only for GoBiz, but for any community looking, looking in the area. And then we help coordinate the local level as well. So it is one coordinated, unified area. And that's something that uh, different areas do very, very well. And it's uh, something we're building a really strong advantages of being, uh, being coordinated. And then on the local level, uh, the communities kind of work together and they cooperate, not, uh, not compete. Because again, everybody benefits when no more than 25% of your uh, economy comes, you know, in your regional economy, you know, comes from one community. It, uh, there's, we're all interconnected. So creating that real estate, that built environment and delivering that last mile, uh, really what is where the local community plays a part in. But without the local, we can't do our jobs at the regional level and we can't communicate that up to the state level. So it's all symbiotic, it's all interconnected. And um, you know, the second thing you take away from anything I said is we're all in this together. We're all, you know, we're all fighting for the same thing and we're all connected together to advance the region. But, uh, you know, as I'm going to wrap this up here and kind of talk about, um, you know, 
California has not done a very good job of telling its own story. For those of us that actually remember the 1980s, the old joke was tax Massachusetts and how bad Massachusetts was and how unfriendly business environment. Unfortunately, California has that reputation. And that's really coming from, you can't open the paper without hearing about different companies leaving you know, or making investments in other states. Um, if you look at the data, it's anecdotal, but unfortunately that's the, the story the media is telling. But, um, but looking at some of the, uh, you know, the actual, some of the data, the startups out of the Bay Area, only 3% are actually leaving the Bay. And the majority of them are actually going to other places in California. And they're not going to the Texases. They're going, you know, the number one state form was actually New York. And uh, people leaving as well, if you look over the past five years of the data, there hasn't been this mass California exodus. The data doesn't support it, but it makes for great headlines and it just reinforces that negative image. So we as a state have to be better of talking about, you know, all the great innovation that we're doing. All these companies were born here. They're some of the most innovative brands in the world. And they got their start here in California because we invest in our people. We invest in our capital that makes companies, uh, you know, more productive. But, um, you know, I'm going to direct you to one thing. If you've got 20 minutes and you haven't yet, um, CNBC did a 20 minute story on the California exodus. And again, talking about some of these major brands. And there was one voice on there. And it's the voice you're going to, uh, is you're going to hear next is Barry. He was the only one talking about the competitive advantage that California has and why California is still a good place to do business. And where is the specific best place to do business? And that's the greater Sacramento area. So that's something as champions and as something as the greater Sacramento Economic Council that we're focused on is to really arm, you know, arm our region with there are a lot of reasons why to be here. And you have a huge competitive advantage to do things here, um, you know, to, to be here, to grow a business and to be successful. So I'm going to leave you with a few takeaways here. Um, you know, successful economies, you know, are regional, not individual. Prosperity, you know, growing our human capital, you know, will drive prosperity, will drive inclusion, and will drive a, uh, an accessible region as well. And focusing on tradable sectors is so, you know, is so important. And, um, you know, we can't grow, you know, an economy without being thoughtful, deliberate, targeted. And we do that by being coordinated. So appreciate, I hope you got a few, uh, you know, a few things out of here with, uh, you know, with this and happy to answer any questions anybody might have. I shouldn't have opened up with, I used to teach statistics. I think I just blocked everybody out with that. So, um, but we will be doing some discussion groups as well. So if you think of something, um, hopefully we'll have a chance to address those as well or throw them in chat. I'll be on there as well. Um, but with that, it is my pleasure to turn it over to, uh, to Barry Broom. He's got 35 years of economic development experience from around the country. And, uh, you know, is our uh, fearless leader has been here six years and uh, in that time has built a world class uh, economic development organization that is my personal pleasure to serve in. So, Barry, thank you for that. And the floor is yours. Thank you. All right. Well, that's why we call Scott the professor. So um, a couple things as we roll into this, I'll just kind of connect some dots. I like to connect dots, right? So when we talk about tradable sectors, what we're really talking about is, um, you know, companies that make products here and sell them outside the market. So a gas station is not a tradable sector. A restaurant's not a tradable sector. A real estate product's not a tradable sector. Rayleigh's is not a tradable sector. And healthcare is not really a tradable sector. You know, you, you know, healthcare is built around a customer base, right? People don't come, occasionally people might, come from Chicago to come in and support something, but it's not really what drives your economy, right? So food and agricultural research products in Davis and Woodland, they make products, Bear Crop Science makes science, technology and products and distribute, distributes that around the world. VSP is a worldwide distributor of products. So when you're thinking about our economy, right? We have government, healthcare, food and ag, small business, the reason the economy hasn't been very dynamic is it doesn't have a very high percentage of tradable sector jobs. The second thing that happens in tradable sector jobs is your incomes go up. So if you're a waiter in San Francisco or a waiter in Humboldt County, you're making, you're making way more money as a waiter in San Francisco. That's not because it's more expensive in San Francisco. That's because San Francisco has a highly sophisticated economy. 
it raises the income for the restaurant and it raises the income for the waiter. So that's why when we work on things like Aggie Square, we consider those inclusion projects. Obviously, uh, there's a lot of friction on housing. So people see any investment now as exasperating the housing problem, right? People that are being bumped out of housing don't participate in these tradable sectors. And so that's why you have the conflict on development in places like California. Now it's starting to happen here. But if you're properly training and elevating people, I just had a conversation this morning. I can get somebody to $100,000 a year's income faster than you can get them a one bedroom apartment. And I can do it for less money. And once you get somebody to $100,000 in income, you've achieved social mobility, regardless of the housing situation, because now they're trained and they can be mobile and make their own choices. So a tradable sector model is the only thing you can work on. You really can't work on small businesses. I mean, you can create service models, but you know, if, if, if Westfield and Roseville starts to contract, like Arden Mall has contracted, what can we do to help Arden Mall? Really nothing. You know, the mall's been disrupted. The anchor tenants are gone. People go online now. So now it's a piece of real estate that's gotta be completely imagined as the sunrise, right? So when you're looking at these malls, by the way, one in four malls, in America will close in the next five years. So we're in the we're in the beginnings of these corrections. So these malls require disposable incomes to come in. If the disposable income goes away, you can't save them all. If the, if the disposable income digitalizes, you can't save them all. Now, if you bring in enough tradable sector activity, you can put some wind in those sales, but that's about it. The way tradable sectors are built, it's the relationship between your university and industries. That's why you see Aggie Square. You know, California, uh, California uh, State Sacramento is leading, you know, the California Mobility Center with UC Davis helping. Aggie Square is being led by UC Davis with Sac State helping. When the students and the training and the information and the technology and the real estate gets tied together, that's how you raise the incomes in your market, right? That's why Mace Road was so important to us. We have that incredible higher education asset in Davis. How do we capture the students and the jobs that it produces? You need a real estate play next to it. Now, obviously, Woodland's making some progress with the research park, so that's good news for us. But, you know, that real estate objective at Mace Road had a lot to do with how do we keep our college kids? How do we create income for the community? And by the way, the nice thing about our real estate is we're largely a science and research community. So those institutions still need real estate. You know, if you built real estate around a digital economy, lots of luck with that. It's going to recover, but not like it was. And, we, and you'll never see office build again like you did in the last 20 years. So when we talk about educational attainment, how many people in your community have a college degree or higher, right? If I'm Google, that's my first question. My second question is how old are they? So Google's not gonna come here to hire me or Professor Powell, right? They're coming here, where's the 23 and 24 year olds? That's all they wanna know. So between 18 and 34, that's the only age group that gets analyzed. So if your public education system starts stalling, if you let your UC Davis graduates move to the Bay Area, if Sac State doesn't graduate their kids, which had had an eight and a half percent graduation rate, that 18 to 34 number looks terrible. And then when employers look at you, they think, well, your smart kids leave and you can't graduate. So you're either not graduating kids or your smart kids leave. If your young people are leaving your community, why would I come into your town and invest? So that's why engineering around these universities is so important. And then these different institutions are service models, right? So Aggie Square is a service model to the life science industry. They're gonna provide genomic services. They're gonna provide cell therapy research for big companies, small companies. So again, the other thing too, what, what, what Scott talked about, it's about investment in jobs, it's not about business attraction. Obviously, we're gonna attract a lot of businesses here. You see, we've paid uh, for about $6 million in public investment from all of our communities. They've gotten all the services, basically they can't afford. They've gotten a partnership with the CEOs and they've gotten $70 million in taxes. So the service model to the local government is you can't replicate what we do. The market won't talk to you. You put a little bit of money in there, the CEOs underwrite the organization. You get services you can't produce on your own and you get a financial return on it. And any economic development strategy by any community has to pay back in dollars. So I do have a question I wanna answer for our mayor. Housing's a challenge. 
yeah, this is this is the new crisis. So the mayor asked, uh, the mayor Davis asked me the question about housing. Well, here's we're in trouble. That's just you know one thing I always like to be is honest. You know, people don't always enjoy my transparency, but you know I don't think it's a great idea to tell your community things that aren't the truth. Up to a year ago, we weren't seeing any change in dynamic, but this last year we probably had. I'm going to say four years worth of migration occur in six months. So all that Bay Area migration, that was about four or five years worth of, of migration that occurred in six months. So we were running our residential properties were running at 3.8% growth. So rents were at 3.8% growth, incomes were at 4.5% growth. So if rents are at 3.8% growth, right, or, and, and, and incomes at 4.5% growth, we're doing just fine. Rents are at 8% growth now. So now rents are growing twice the average rate of income and we'll do so for two years. That's gonna cause a lot of problems for us. It's gonna inflate payrolls for businesses because you're gonna have to pay people more. So one of the things that we're doing right now is we're working on two things. We need a very low housing plan solution. So even though this is a, a great example, we're working on how do you build 15,000 affordable housing units? We have found a product that can be built for about $150,000 a unit that's nice, that two people can live in, that rents for $1,000. Now it's been prototyped, so we're gonna roll that out. Uh, the other thing we have to do is we're gonna, we're gonna need some state government reform. So you're gonna see the organization write a CEQA reform policy with the business leadership and ask the state to bow out of that. The problem with housing is once you fall behind it, it's a 10 year horizon between the environmental reviews and the community planning process and the entitlement process. It's about a 10 year review process. So once you fall behind, that's why people can't catch up in California. So um, there's data out of Stanford that this housing crisis started when CEQA took over too much role in real estate. So you're gonna have to reform CEQA uh, you're going to have to make it more attractive for folks to build. And then I think the other challenge for us is going to be materials. Lumber materials are going through the roof, like 200% over last year. So we're going to have a couple years of rocky housing. Uh, we're going to have a couple years of really good economic growth. And what we're looking at now as an organization is where are we in 2024? Because we know 22, 23, we're going to grow back hard. In 2024, are we going to be able to hold our prosperity position and our equity position and are we gonna be able to level off these housing prices? They're starting to come down a little bit. So the good news on the housing market is you're seeing a cooling in the pricing, but Portland had no change in housing year to year. Austin had no change in housing year to year, but they built 25,000 units a year. We built 8,000 units. So it's a production issue. So I'll, I'll roll through this, but I wanted to you know connect the dots a little bit on this. And if there's any questions for me, please let me know. So it's a public-private partnership, it's one movement, right? You wanna start a company here, my employees have to afford housing. If you wanna start a company here, I need some nice real estate. If you wanna start a company here, I want a relationship with the university, right? If you wanna expand your company, you're having the same conversation. If you're locating your company into this community, you're asking us the same questions. So the reason you see all this data and analytics is it's really an investment in jobs platform that we're building. Our direct service model is more business attraction, brand marketing communications, and retention expansion. But we play big roles in the creation of uh, technology accelerators like we're working with Davis on a food nag, Woodlands food nag. We're working with one on Rockland Lincoln. We're working on one in Folsom. Aggie Square's got an accelerator and the California Mobility Center will have one. So when you're looking at the model of the community, right? The startups are gonna be, are gonna create new jobs, but employers that come in are gonna to wanna to partner with the startups. So it's really about connecting the ecosystem around your talent, your market position, and then picking markets of the future. One of the, you know, it's, it's ironic, but it's a big mistake to work with your local economy if you're trying to change your economic position because your local economy is a byproduct of your tradable sector. So if you're not in the future of work, if you're not in e-mobility, if you're not in cell therapies, right? You're gonna be out of business because all your old economic models are always gonna contract, right? Now you got this digitalization that's gonna disrupt healthcare. You're gonna see telemedicine. 
you're going to see less head counts in healthcare. You're going to see less physical buildings, right? So you always got to be moving forward, connecting your people and talent, and you always got to be constantly repositioning your community on your future. So next slide. Right. So obviously, um, we run a automated artificial intelligence, machine learning, LinkedIn dependent outreach program. So site selectors, whenever you hear Google, whenever you hear Intel, whenever you hear uh, Amazon, the companies themselves aren't who we're negotiating with. We're negotiating with their consulting network. So these companies build investment committees. They hire Deloitte to look at the data on taxes. They hire ENY to look at their workforce. Right. They, they hire a C to a Hill to look at your infrastructure. So when we're working with companies, it's a big data exchange is all it is, is we're going back and forth proving that their project can efficiently work here. The PR marketing and branding for the region that Michelle does is largely to put us on the radar screen of those consultants and companies, but also to make us more attractive for talent. And then obviously um, research and value propositions on our design is it so like right now i've been working on major league soccer what are we doing we're redesigning the stadium to try to save 120 million right so it's not like we're looking for a billionaire we're looking to redesign the product so a billionaire will come in because the stadium costs have been a big factor on that and then obviously we want our community to be competitive so everywhere in this region your our local communities are all dramatically better at this work than they were five or six years ago you map it out, you build it around tradable sectors, right? You grow a prosperity model. You go in and train folks, you connect them to prosperity. You know, now we need, we need to get our head around homelessness and we got to get on the ball on this, home, on this housing situation so we don't end up in the kind of trouble we've seen in California. So you're going to see this economy roaring back in two years. Um, you're going to see it. I mean, it may be the hottest you've ever seen it, but we got to make sure we're sustainable and balanced and we got to pay attention to equity right we don't want all the money to go to the top and we don't want to push people out of their houses next slide so as i mentioned um 76 million dollars in direct tax income to our local communities 129 million to california this is why states and communities work on economic development they make money on it it's an income producer the jobs if you attach them to equity programs can change your uh uh, economic position from a sustainability standpoint. Next two years, our average wage is going to hit eighty thousand bucks or higher. I think it's going to be eighty-three thousand. So that's how that's the good news. So we got better employers, better economic activity. The incomes are going up dramatically. So that's going to offset some of the housing problems. But we got to make sure we're training people for the future, and we're still struggling with training in our community. Most of what we do from a training standpoint is really very poor. Uh, our uh, workforce investment boards are, are, are not doing a very good job. That's not a criticism of them. Workforce invest, investment boards aren't doing a good job anywhere in the country. So there's a problem with the entire system from the beginning. And as you'll see through my presentation, we're already finding ways to disrupt workforce to make it more equitable and higher wage. So this is, um, you know, uh, obviously we pay attention to return on investments. So when we work with our community so that we don't politicize our work, what am I getting for this? Services you can't produce, leadership you can't produce, partnerships you can't produce, and you're making money on the relationship. It's a, it's a return on investment model, being able to plug and play into a larger vehicle that allows them to have services they can't pay for their own. Like our research budget's $500,000 a year. If you're Davis, Citrus Sites, Elk Grove, or Folsom, when that big company or that technology company connects you and their consultants start asking questions, you're gonna to need to answer those data points and verify them. And it's a half a million dollars just to maintain it in the region. So um, they get a return and a shared service. Next slide. Boom. Keep going. Yeah. So these are factoids. They don't really do anything for you, you know, quite honestly. But, you know, you know, whenever you hear, oh, you know, the Sacramento area is the seventh best place for this. It's the number one housing market. We constantly build these data points. Like I got interviewed by Fortune magazine on what we're doing on MLS. And it's like being a politician running for office. 
All I did was talk about educational attainment standards. You know, I talked about tech workers moving here. So I was like, we should have an MLS team because our educational attainment standards now 35%. Well, the gold standard in the US is 38. We were at 30, right? So we're trying to get the 38 so that we're at the gold standard on educational attainment. So all these bullet points and factoid points are really nothing more than things that we push out that get captured in stories about us that when they're read, trigger the right response from a venture capitalist, an investment banker, or a company. So even when we're talking about farm the fork and MLS, we're really not talking about that. We're really feeding tradable sector investment data through channels. So we're better at investing public dollars than most states. So one of the things we do is defend California. California is the most productive and profitable economy in America. So if you run a business in California, you're gonna make more money than you run a business in Texas. That's a guarantee. If you have an insurance business in California, that insurance business in Austin doesn't make as much. So the way we talk about companies, you pay a 13.3% tax in California, you got a 0% tax in Austin. What if your income is 25% higher in California? Where are you making more money? You're making more money in California. So this is one of our frustrations with the state and they, they keep telling us they're gonna do something about it, but Gavin Newsom should be on the point nationally going to the Wall Street Journal, articulating California is the most efficient, productive, wealth-driven economy in the United States. And when we get public dollars, we put more in community colleges, we put more in workforce systems, we put more in universities in the other states. So even though Nevada and tax, Texas offer you a zero income tax, they don't offer you a higher return. What are you in business for? To avoid taxes or make money? If you're in business to make money, you make more money in California to do any other place. And by the way, this is by several hundred to a thousand percent. That's how much more money you make in California than Texas. Next slide. And by the way, that was Ernst & Young. So we use other people's data points. So, you know, we're the local guys that have to pitch and present the case to the community. So when we use data points, we love using other people's data points. So the data points on production came out of Forbes and the data point on profitability came out of Fortune and that data point that we use public money was uh, came out of ENY and it was funded by uh, the Rockefeller Foundation in New York by asking ENY, find the most efficient, productive economy in America. And it said it was California. ENY in New York saying that, not us. We're just sharing the information. 21% of our workforce comes to and from the Bay Area. This is really important because now as you're looking at this $3 trillion stimulus bill coming out of the Biden administration, the Bay Area Council is leading the charge to connect Roseville, Sacramento, and Davis on Amtrak. So we're trying to make the Amtrak a high-speed position, which is the only way you're going to solve housing and, and, and workforce distribution issues, but they're calling for it now. So five years ago, we were calling for it. Now they're calling for it. And we're able to supplement the Bay Area Council's leadership because they're now agreeing with us. Bay Area and Sacramento region is one economy now in one market. So great airport, right? So we're starting to see more foreign direct investment. We're gonna announce the largest foreign direct investment deal in the history of our community in the next six weeks, we're pretty sure. We have two R&D centers moving here, uh, one from Chicago, one from Menlo Park, 400 researchers. They're not going to be in Sacramento, but they're coming because of Aggie Square. So both those R&D centers are coming because of Aggie Square. The 750 software engineering jobs from Asia are coming because of our digital upskilling. So they're not like picking housing and quality of life. They're running numbers and they're looking at our science and they're looking at our capabilities. But the other thing they look at is we got a great second tiered airport. So you can get a lot of direct flights to Chicago. You got 17 direct flights to Seattle. You got a lot of direct flights to Dallas. So uh, we have the really about the highest performing second tiered airport in the country. Gets rated number one in the country for service. And if you remember when the county made that big investment 15 years ago, everybody kind of gave them a hard time. They built this big airport. It was way too big. It put a bunch of financial pressure on the county. Well, now it's driving the economy and they're talking about a third runway. So we're now working on an expansion. So when this becomes more of an international airport, you're going to see more international companies, but that's probably five or 10 years out. 
again, same thing on pivots. You know, we're, you know, we're the number one market on women founded enterprises. We're the fastest growing community. Again, these are things you read about these things. We're organizing them and we're putting them in the stories. Someone does a story, someone does a story on communities and community economic development. Michelle hunts that story down. We get on the call with them and we feed them the data that we accumulate like this. And so you'll see the SAC B run some story. Hey, Axiom said the Sacramento area is the number one place for women founded businesses in the United States. We find the data in our analytics and back channel it to outlets like that. And then it ends up in the B and it's like magic, but Michelle does it. So I talked a little bit about this. Um, we're, uh, we're so worried about this, to be honest with you, we're sick to our stomach, you know, and I, I've been getting some crap from people because, you know, I was like, eh, it ain't going to happen to us, you know, but, you know, I didn't know about COVID. So basically they've talked about COVID having a 10 year acceleration in certain things and it will, this is one of the 10 year accelerations. So it's both a really good story because the profile of the people moving here are 35 and under and they're educated, which is exactly what we need, right? That's exactly what we need as an organization. We need people 18 to 35 that are educated. That's what drives the entire economy. Um, so the, these folks that are moving up here are under 35 and they're educated. So once they settle in, that educational attainment number will come up. That'll drive more tradable, tradable sector investment. That'll trigger more incomes. But if we don't get the housing situation in control, we're going to be a little bit in trouble. So as you can see on the slide, basically the national average for housing is like 13, 14%. So the housing market's exploding nationally. It's exploding everywhere. Uh, it's not just exploding here, but uh, what concerns us in our community, as you know, in California, um, we don't have a very good track re record of building houses. So when we get pressure like this, it worries us more. Austin, Phoenix can turn around next year and build 50, 60,000 houses with no problem. You get 24 hour construction permits in Phoenix. So if I wanted to build a housing development in Phoenix, I was the president there 10 years. Someone came in and said, you have a housing problem. I'm gonna build 10,000 houses. They'd go here, get going. If you own the land, they'd let you start. They will let you start the improvements before you went through zoning. So they immediately start construction on the housing project. If it's agricultural land or whatever, break ground and get going. So while the project's underway, then they go through the zoning. And then at the end of the zoning, when they get through building it, they let the private sector decide, do you want to give immediate occupancy to this? Or do you want us to preview it before you do the occupancy? So they will actually give occupancy permits post being built and occupied. Now, the risk is if they walk in and find something that's not in compliance, they make you tear it down. So they do enforce it, but the developers got to decide if they want to take that risk. Most of them don't because the community can usually get through it in under 90 days. Almost any product in Phoenix can break ground in 90 days. That's really where we got to get to on housing. And, and uh, I, I know that's going to be a long shot, but that's what we need. So, you know, we pay attention. This is this is goes back to the name of the game, right? And the, all these are based upon things you may have heard. If you've been in our community a long time, oh, your community doesn't have the talent. You ever heard that? Plenty, right? So that's why this stuff is so talent. Your community is not a cool place to live. Believe me, I made 2,133 presentations between San Francisco and San Jose my first four and a half years on this job. That's no joke, face to face. So I know everything about that market. I know every attitude towards us. And then when I come up here and build our pitch decks and our market position, you know, we take our data that we can verify, and then we apply it towards the street smarts we get from those positions. All we got to be is the best alternative to the Bay Area. We'll have as big economy as we want. Um, we are building out foreign direct investment. As, as uh, Scott, we hired a new leader with a European background that'll start April 1. But uh, the name of the game's talent. Young people, can you keep it? And is your community sustainable for their lifestyle? And we're now producing the people, the talent. We address sustainability. We'll be anything we want to be. So the other thing too, um, you know, taxes, taxes, taxes. But if you look at our cost picture, we're almost the same cost as Austin. Why is that? Well, Austin has very high property taxes. If you look at the property taxes on Austin, 
they're more than twice that of uh, California. So a lot of people don't know how Prop 13 works, but if you look how low the property taxes are in Los Angeles, how high they are in Austin, how high they are in Denver. So property taxes are almost double. And so once you get into a double property tax, right, then all of a sudden you're, um, you know, if you look at fringe benefits, they're very similar. Now it gets down to how tight your labor market is. You know, really what a lot of people don't know is taxes are a very small part of a business cost. Just think of that. It's almost the smallest part of your cost. So if we can make a productivity argument and show them that building and construction and property taxes are below market. So what we tell people is you're gonna pay a higher income tax here. You're gonna get a higher income. So you gotta share that with us. So we can give you these students and these talented people that are making you more productive, which is how you're becoming profitable in the first place. So when we when people are talking about you know California dying in the Bay Area, I get on the phone. It's the Stanford moving to Texas. No, well, well you, know, you know, when Stanford moves to Texas, call me. I'll move to Texas, right? When Cal Berkeley moves to Texas, we're in a lot of trouble. If University of California San Francisco moves to Texas, we're in a lot of trouble. The Bay Area is repopulating like this right now. They've almost recovered 66 percent of their losses, and they really flattened out but they kept their kids. You know, the tech workers didn't leave the Bay areas and the startups didn't leave. So, you know, it's bouncing back. And our advantage is, you know, we have our own ecosystem and we can partner with theirs. So this is new words, employee experience. So when you hear us say employee experience, that's because when ENY, Deloitte, KPMG, McKinsey work with us on behalf of their clients, they now come to us and say, tell us about your, the employee experience. So each one of these consulting houses, like anything in life, they get their own buzzwords. So when we hear employee experience and we go online and read about these guys and they're coaching the companies on employee experience, we take all our lifestyle issues and we present the employee experience. So obviously we all live here so we know how spectacular the community is. Everything from Davis, Woodland, our own wine country, we can pop down the Napa if we want. Uh, winters, you know, we can ski in Tahoe, you know, everyone keeps forgetting uh, Tahoe is in Placer County too. Uh, you know, river streams, you know, Folsom, El Dorado Hills, Auburn, you know, we just have this eclectic lifestyle here that we think is very rich. And that's, a, and when we sell that lifestyle, we're really selling it to the talent, not to the company, because the HR talent people will drive this conversation into the company. The company's trying to figure out how much money they're going to make and how quick they can get in the ground. And then, you know, obviously rents, you know, rents are not cheap, but if you look what's going on, it's not cheap anywhere. Denver's not cheap. Um, Phoenix is not cheap and Austin's not cheap. So unfortunately, if you want to live in an inexpensive place, I mean, I looked up like Butte, Montana, like Charleston, places that have been <clears throat> really expensive, inexpensive housing places. They're at 350,000 bucks now. <clears throat> the national average house for sale right now is selling for over 350 grand. That's the national average. So that means Iowa, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Indiana, all those low cost places, right? Tennessee, you know, the national price is around 350. And of course we're at 450, and we want to make sure we stay under 500. And then we want to address the workforce and very low income housing piece. So this is our tradable sector plan, right? So now you got these big institutional moves that allow tradable sectors to partner. So the California Mobility Center has Lear, Microsoft, Ford, and Toyota on the board. Just so you know, those are their chief technology officers. In the case of Toyota, it's their chief financial officer. They're on the board in Sacramento. They don't even live here. Some of them don't live in California, but we got them on the board on the basis that we're going to be a leader in e-mobility and California is going to drive it. So what this does is we have a one to two million square foot electric vehicle product in the market. And when we talk to them about building here, we show them, look, the California Resource Board is going to create your market. My university is going to give you all the talent. All the software for your industry comes out of the Bay Area. 
And now I have this California Mobility Center, which is a hardware play. I can make your engine. So the California Mobility Center will be able to design engines and batteries for companies. If it's a startup with an engine and battery, we can work on it with them and help them develop it. The partnership comes out of Penn Motion, out of Aachen University in Germany. Aggie Square, the Cambridge Innovation Center, took 100,000 square feet at Aggie Square. It's the commercialization arm of MIT and Harvard. We're their only third location. And then FinTech is new, but if you saw where SoFi bought a local bank, you're gonna see banks digitalize aggressively. And it's important that we connect people to it. And then we're, we're making a lot of momentum on MLS. I'm, a, I'm concerned about it because obviously they backed out, but we could have a legitimate deal in 30 days. We'll just see how it comes together. So you're an e-mobility company in Roseville. How do I retain you? Who's making your hardware? We can do that for you. Where are you getting your engineers? I can do that for you at Sac State. You're, there's 538 life science companies in town. How many of them need genomic services? All of them. How many of them are interested in cell therapeutics? All of them. Where is the center of excellence for that industry? Aggie Square. So as you can see, we attracted IBM. We attracted the Cambridge Innovation Center. There are 12 companies that have been attracted to Aggie Square. They'll be announced when they break ground. But also the 538 companies in the region, they're more likely to be retained here if they look, look up and go, wow, there's a $1.1 billion investment in my industry right in the middle of my town. I must be in the right place. So that's basically the retention expansion piece. You know, same thing, it's an inverted sales model. So what we do in the Bay Area, we'll now do in Davis, we'll now do in, in Roseville. All we do is just flip the direction. And a lot of this is gonna be digitalized with the LinkedIn program we're developing. Keep on, thank you. So it's a public-private partnership, right? It's a business modeling organization. It designs the economy. It works with the local electeds. So if we design the economy around cell therapies, we need Mace Road to happen. If we design the economy around cell therapies, hey, we need Woodland to happen. If we design the economy around cell therapies, we need Aggie Square to happen. If we're gonna flip the switch on carbon and lower our carbon footprint, why not make it our business so we can create jobs? But we gotta connect people who aren't you know, being prepared to go into that industry, right? So instead of having the training models, train people for local employers, no mas, $18,000 a year jobs, cut it out. Mary, you gotta help me with that. Train them for the future, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100,000 dollars a year. And that's the switch, right? So you build your tradable sector service model around tradable sectors of the future, and then you train people for the future of work and then you connect the dots and then you ride the wave up. And then locally you're building the employment centers necessary like Mace, like Woodland, like Aggie Square for the future industries. So that when it takes off, you don't have the industry take off here, acquire your people here and then go to Seattle or go to Boston because that's the only place they can find labs. Next slide. That's it, man, that was quick. You did good. You it was you're lightning. <laughs> uh, uh, well, let me hold on before I, before yeah. we put the star on. Any any thoughts or questions? Did everybody did everybody does everybody know what a tradable sector is? So this is what I did in Arizona. You know, I used to work with a libertarian legislature. They could only learn three things outside of they wanted to give guns away, right? And I would walk in and say, if someone comes to you and tells you there's a bill for economic development, here's what I want you to ask. Is it a tradable sector product? If it isn't, don't do it. Unless you're doing a car dealership and you're collecting a bunch of income, right? Two, you know, is it gonna create jobs that produce higher wages than you currently have in your community? Otherwise, don't do it. We don't wanna invest in low wage models. And then three, are, is this economic development plan percolating throughout your community and are they connecting it to underserved communities? So when it takes off, it, it brings everybody along. And then you take all your assets, your amenity, and you polish your brand around it. And then everything gets skewed towards that direction. And then people are worried about what happens to the ethnic businesses? What are we doing with all these nail salons? What about these small pizza parts? What about these family businesses? 
Well, when the top end of the economy takes off, they spend all into those local models and that's how they recover. And the underserved community requires the tradable sector to lift the lower economic model up, both in wages and opportunity. And then concurrently, we need to be addressing the skills gap so they can move off that entry model into a tradable model. And we didn't really cover our, our skills uh, program, but you know we just finished training 40 underserved people 93% graduated with a certification. Average wage is about fifty thousand. Barry, I think Jenny um, Jenny has a question because I want I want you guys I want everyone to feel comfortable that this is an open forum um, that you can ask us questions. So Jenny, did you have a question? I do. Thank good. you so much, Barry. This was fantastic. It's good to see you. Good to see um, you. Yeah, this is so great. I feel like this is in part like Sacramento 101. So I wish I would have learned this, you know, many years ago. Um, so I'm listening and I'm thinking and I appreciate being part of the Economic Competitive Council. Um, if I understand this correctly, economic development scorecards are really measuring the uh, educational attainment at the bachelor's degree level. They don't count high school, they don't count associates. And if I also understand correctly, some sectors, the certificates, associate degrees can actually put people at that um, better than gainful employment, like high wages, um, not to replace bachelor's degrees, but you sort of have two things, not working at cross purposes, but not completely aligned. So my two questions are, how many bachelor's degrees would it take in this region to move our scorecard up 1%? And then how, how um, what's the timeline for this like critical need to increase educational attainment for the 25 to 34 population? Okay, well, it's, you know, as soon as we, we were at 3031. So between Robert's work at Sac State and Gary May's work and the kids moving up here from the Bay Area, we got the 35. But we're not the only, one of the things we have to remember when we're competing is our competitors aren't going to sleep, right? So it's not like Austin's working less hard. So when we got the 35, Austin got the 40 and Portland got the 38. So the good news for educators is the bar keeps going up. You know, when I first got here, you got to get the 35. I got the 35, now you got to be at 38. So, um, so my hunch is I'd like to see us at 38 to 40. What we did on with, uh, we need 60,000 more bachelor's degree to get to 38. Okay. Hornet Attain has a 60,000 bachelor's degree strategy because Robert's tying it in to the attainment number we have to deliver. So what that is, that's an optics play, right? So now you're at 38%, Google calls me, Microsoft calls me, Intel calls me, they all call you now. You're on a very short list, maybe 12 places in the United States that are at 38%, right? And then when they come in, now they start scrubbing down. How many of those are kids? Who's got the engineering degrees? Show me your software, right? So it starts with the macro and it gets more qualified. Now, the nice thing about certifications is the labor shortages are so bad right now for these companies is they're now like, hey, we'll take a certification. So certifications, you're gonna see us do more certifications because you know we're being told there's now out of the Bay Area in Silicon Valley, and we're going to bring two programs here to the community. So there's a program called like Bay Valley Tech that has put 70 Latino kids, 70 percent of their clients are Latino kids out of Modesto, putting them in six figure jobs, seven months training, 3,500 bucks. So you're going to see that's the kind of stuff SETA ought to be doing, right? So now at the higher ed level and even at the community college level. Why couldn't that technology certification by the Bay Area group just get plugged in at Los Rios? Why can't it be in Yolo's uh, community college system? You see what I mean? Yeah, I know that's great. I'm thinking about that, um, that pipeline. I appreciate that and the idea of uh, embracing stackable credentials, right, from our um, community colleges, uh, all our higher ed providers and really thinking also about Project Attain, you know, leading uh, the regional initiative, Hornet Attain being at Sac State, um, focusing on this 25 to 34 as we look at all the adults with some college, no degree, some certificate, no degree, some diploma, no, or some high school education, but no diploma, like how can we spur the pipeline on with that? 
Yeah, so I had another question for Kenneth. Um, what we're talking about on these digital skills, that's that's the right question, right? So what our frustration with the workforce program, he asked me, when are we gonna get African-American people in the middle income jobs? Well, if you look at the training model, and this drives me out of, out of my mind, we train people for, we're training people to be poor. If you complete the training programs in Sacramento, when you're done, you're gonna be poor. And that's the craziest thing I've ever done, ever seen. And of course, what I can tell you, I did five years of intense workforce training. When you train someone to be poor, you know what they do? They never get trained again. So everybody going through these workforce boards are getting trapped by going through a training module that takes months. The nonprofit's getting paid. When we did our digital upskill, we paid the employees. So on my digital upskill program we designed with the Urban League was $18,000 a year. $9,000 was payment to the person. We paid people to be trained. We paid them so they could quit their $15 an hour job. The rest was in training. We did it in 12 weeks and we got them the $48,000, $100% placement. Not everybody took the job, but we will play every single person that finished we got them a job average in 50 grand. So this is part of the frustration, right? So you got a workforce board that's training people to go mop floors at Golden One. We're spending $20 million a year to teach people to work in food service at 15 bucks an hour. It's outrage, teaching them customer service skills. You can, you can learn that stuff on YouTube. So we need to blow up those training models and put hard technical skills in folks' hands. They will move up. Right now, um, Hardeep Gulati at Power School told me he would take 50 of our graduates. Well, I don't have any left. They're all gone. He asked me for 50. VSP wants 10. These are high school diploma, 12-week certification. I'll take 50. 50. You could be changing so many people's lives right now if you were connecting them to real jobs. The people we trained... Hey, they didn't have a lick of IT experience. You know, they were, they, they had high school diplomas. Some of them did have college, uh, but most of them were working at Starbucks and places like that and couldn't move up the food chain. They were working at hotels and lost their jobs. They had good work experiences. You know, I mean, they had, they proved they could show up to work, but they didn't have any digital skills. And now, um, you know, so these workforce programs should be training people for 2028, 2030, not now. And then at the local level, remember, you can't affect that, right? Can't affect those employers. They live off the larger economy. All right, thanks, Barry. So I'm gonna quickly go over um, our marketing and PR initiatives for the organization, and then we'll go back to um, asking more questions. So I'm a little biased. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michelle Willard. I'm the Vice President of Marketing and Communications for the organization. I believe I have the best job in the world. I get to market our region and promote our region, which is so much fun. Uh, it has definitely changed over the last year um, drastically due to COVID-19. We're not just fighting for jobs and investment. And you know we are very data-driven, analytics heavy, but as remote working, really changes the game, people are able to now choose where they want to work and live. So how do we market the Sacramento region on a national level um, to market our area as the best place to work and live? So we launched our What's Next Out West campaign. And so this campaign is basically, we want to be the next city out west where people reimagine where they work and live and kind of we have the best of everything for them to offer. So we launched this millennial talent attraction campaign on December 8th. Uh, the website is what's next out west.com and we're using using two hashtags next out west and then rethink remote. So if you go to the Greater Sacramento Economic Council social media platforms, you will see kind of those two hashtags. And we're really promoting the lifestyle that we have to offer in the Sacramento region. We did a video which is pinned to the top of our social media platforms. And you can also see it on the website. If you click um, that play button, I would show it here, but the videos tend to lag on Zoom. And it just kind of, we interviewed remote workers who actually lived in the Sacramento region. So none of that video is scripted. That's actually 
what people feel about living and working in our region that um, you know have jobs in the Bay Area. So um, we launched this campaign and we've had more than 7 million people um, kind of view this campaign through media efforts. And we've had more than 130,000 um, views on the video through our social platforms. So we hope to really reach a large audience and kind of really showcase what our region um, has to offer. And we have um, a jobs database. Um, so if you, you know, if you're a company on this call that wants us to put um, the jobs on here, we're more than happy to do that as well. But um, so we're we're kind of repositioning ourselves as the next city out west and we're the best city out west for business because we are you know competing against all major cities out west right now salt lake is a great example of kind of where people another place where people want to you know work remotely so we've got to really showcase all that our region has to offer for these remote workers so these are um, kind of what the campaign looks like, some images. Um, if you go on our Instagram pages or Facebook, um, Twitter, et cetera, and those are kind of um, a little bit of our metrics uh, right there. And so does anyone have any questions in terms of marketing our region or kind of those efforts? Or if you want to get engaged, um, you know, please feel free to ask me questions or, or reach out. Okay, now going back, um, if everyone can turn on their cameras who wants to kind of engage, because we have about 10 minutes. Um, does everyone understand, you know, I know Barry mentioned tradable sector uh, jobs. Um, does anyone have anything where they really learn something that they want to point out um, from today's presentation? Or a criticism. Or, yeah. Yeah, feel free to criticize us. We'll blame Scott. That's all. That's why he's on the in here. Whatever you don't like, I'm I'm sorry for Scott Powell's lack of leadership. Yeah, uh, we're, we're all about accountability as long as we blame Scott. I had a question, if that's all right. Yeah, you can ask any question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks, by the way, for the talk. Really informative. I'm calling in from Dublin, Ireland, so I apologize if you hear the rain uh, <laughs> pouring down over here. It's a bit wet and dark and awful, but. I uh, would way rather be in California at the moment, uh, but stuck here for the time being. Um, I have two businesses, uh, Irish businesses, um, both in the equine sector, one very established in the United States, making eight figures in revenues, but nothing out west. So all kind of east of the Mississippi. Another one is a, a startup business, uh, specifically software technology platform that's been approved by the California Horse Racing Board around animal welfare. And you mentioned a lot of things around promoting businesses to come into the region, helping them. What, what exactly would you say to, you know, companies who are looking to establish in California, obviously not your massive companies, why would they choose this region over, say, the Bay Area? Because the big thing as an international company is, you know, as soon as you say, oh, we're going to have our office, everyone assumes it's going to be San Francisco, L.A., you know, that's where you're going to establish a business. So what, what would you say to companies like ours? Why would you say, okay, don't go there, come here? I know you've said a lot of it, but what are the connections and that you can make with people in the region to help them grow their businesses? Yeah, I mean, typically, I mean, the, the quick one is you saw the labor data between San Francisco and Sacramento, right? Mm -hmm. That's a common labor market. So if you were to go in the San Francisco, you'd want to tap that technical talent. So let's just take Cal Berkeley. We talked a lot about UC Davis and Sac State. Uh, I'm in downtown Sacramento. Cal Berkeley's an hour and 15 minutes from my office. That is oftentimes considered, it's certainly considered the number one public school in the United States for the technical engineering expertise you need. So when you're in our community, you're really accessing Berkeley as well as UC Davis and Sac State. And an emerging company like yours will build services around you. So we love the Bay Area. You know, if you want to go to the Bay Area, we'll introduce you to Bay Area Council and we'll try and help you. But if you go in the Bay Area, you're going to be on your own. Like there's no hand holding. Here's where you go and here's how you do things. I mean, the Bay Area has four or 500 startups close on an A or B round every three months. 
Yeah, we have like 14 clothes on them or 20, like a typical market our size. So if you come into our community, we're going to help you with angel investors, venture rounds. We'll help you with a go-to-market strategy. I mean, our university presidents will talk to you. We'll connect you to engineering talent. We'll also build a brand around your company. But we're so heavily connected in the Bay Area. I mean, who do you need to know? We can, we can introduce you to Facebook, Salesforce, Google, Apple, uh, Andreessen Horowitz, you know, uh, uh, Draper Fisher. I mean, so we have about 140 funds in the Bay Area and Silicon Valley that take our calls. Uh, you can syndicate capital from Sacramento in the Bay Area. So if you get your early stage capital in our community, your follow on and syndication capital is very easy out of San Francisco. Obviously, your burn rate's going to be lower, right? Your payroll is going to be lower, and you're going to have the same exit. Mm -hmm. okay. and, when, and, and yeah, and that last one on the, on the technical side, the other piece that's really important for you, and, and we talk a lot about this one on one with companies. You know, um, this 750 job deal that's coming into town, you know, they're out of India. So who are they going to have running that company? People from India. All right. So if you've got, you know, if your leadership's team from India, do you want to be in Texas or do you want to be in California? You know, which, you know, this is also, you know, one of the three or four most uh, diverse cultures in America, the greater Sacramento region. So we're used to Europeans. We're used to people from India, Japan, China. So you're living in this kaleidoscope of people and constituencies and nationalities. And uh, it's, it's very uh, congruent and altruistic place where uh, people from anywhere in the world is greeted with uh, uh, graciousness in our community. So depending on H-1B visas, you know, we're a, we're a sanctuary state. Um, you know, we're very, we're very positive towards uh, immigrants. So you're still getting the same benefits in San Francisco. Uh, you're just not um, dealing with the same cost. And, and if you want to connect like with those explosive engineers, you can always hire three or four people in Palo Alto, put them in some WeWork space, you know, so you can hire if you got got some Stanford engineers you want, and they don't want to live in our community. And you know, they got a, a trailing spouse that's working for Google down there. You know, put them in some WeWork space down here and build the bulk of your office here. So we're the number one place for Bay Area people moving to. And we're also the number three place for technology talent moving to in the country. So you can migrate them in or you can leave them there and telework. No, thanks, Mel. Yeah, um, I was going to say, you know, it's something where I can understand if it's a massive company coming in. But I'm, I'm talking kind of your small, medium sized businesses, you know, making tens of millions not billions a year but obviously are still part of the economy you know we're, we're probably not going to need massively qualified engineers uh to do it but obviously we'll need software engineers we'll need people to kind of do that work and no, it's we, just yeah we have a company called rhombus systems we mm -hmm. brought up here with two guys from silicon valley zenify we brought up here two people one from san francisco one from roseville um, and we brought a company up here called Trifecta, two people. All, you know, uh, Rhombus Systems got 200 engineers starting next year. Zenify's got 250 engineers, and uh, Trifecta's up to 400 people. Three years ago, they had five folks. So we're big fans of helping companies with five, 10 people to come into our community. You're a tradable sector, right? You make a product and sell it globally. So yeah. you're in our wheelhouse. We don't care how big you are, right? We didn't say big. Yeah, we, we don't. Yeah, we don't care how big you are. So yeah. that we definitely yeah. want everyone to leave that with that yeah. point in mind. Yeah. So you know, you come in. We'll build a business team around you. We'll help you go to market. We'll get you capital. When you plant in the ground up here, every every employee you have is going to love it here. And when you scale, your people are going to want to stay, and you're going to be able to draw the talent here. Okay. Awesome. Here, Thanks. Here, we'd love to connect with you offline and, and have a conversation with you about our market and um, what we can do for you. Yeah. I, I think I've connected with one of your team, Hunter. I have actually a couple of calls set up next week with Great. some of the local people there. And I know you see Davis already because I, I do um, lecturing for the Californian state government already for the, for the California horse racing board. So I have a lot of connections in Sacramento obviously is where the state government is. So it makes sense. When you also sense. mentioned horse, tell me about your business again. So we're a technology platform um, specifically. So we digitally track the health of horses. So well, as you know, UC, Davis, in UC Davis is 
large animal veterinarian school is the best. Yeah, so Dr. Dr. Rick Arthur is the head of the California Horse Racing Board. So he is the head and he's a UC Davis professor. So um, yeah, just so you know, <laughs> so he's based there. So in terms of the equine market, California is one of the big five. Um, so California, Texas, New York, Maryland, Florida. Um, so yeah, California and California is leading the way in terms of regulations to ensure the welfare of horses. So hence why we've launched into the state there. We operate in Europe and Asia already, but California is kind of leading the way uh, in the country at the moment. So, but yeah, happy to talk offline. Um, but thank you very much for the talk. I think it was very interesting. Yeah. And uh, let us know which community you want to move to. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, my, I'm, I'm half American. So I have a lot of family in California. Hey, I'm working on my mother was born in Ireland. I'm working on my citizenship. Well, there you go. Well, my mother was born in New York, but my whole family moved out to California. I've got family in San Francisco and LA, but I've been to Sacramento a number of times. So, awesome. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Mayor, you want to give us, you want to bring us home, our uh, outstanding mayor from Rockland? I, I was enjoying that conversation with Pierce. And I, I Pierce, if you're looking for equine uh, businesses, I don't think the Bay Area is going to be as attractive to you as the Sacramento area. So come on down. Uh, Loomis will take you in a heartbeat and you'll be close to some great, uh, some great folks. <laughs> And, and I will tell you, the biggest thing I missed last year, uh, my son's a Notre Dame grad, my nephew's at Navy, and we were supposed to be in Ireland for Notre Dame Navy football game last September, and I'm still crushed we missed it. Oh, it's lovely when you come over. It's, it's a lovely, lovely thing when you guys come over and you do all the, <laughs> the parading through the city. Everyone's going, what's going on? It's, it's not St. Patrick's Day. It's not March. What's going on here? <laughs> you know, it's kind of like when I traveled to Mexico the first time with my Cinco de Mayo shirt, and they told me we don't really celebrate that here. And I felt very <laughs> foolish. No, exactly. But thank you so much. I appreciate you guys. I especially appreciate having staff letting me uh, do the closing remarks and tell you a little bit about me in Rockland. And, and hopefully the participants won't run out the door. I'll, I'll get a couple of words in before I send you off. A um, little bit about our family. The uh, Gildo family has always been involved in small business. Uh, my, both my mother and father-in-law's families emigrated from Spain right to Rockland in 1908. Uh, my mother-in-law's parents had a little Rockland market, and they had the house behind the market she was born in in 1922. And I tell you, she was a force. Um, she ran a very successful restaurant here in Rockland for 30 years. And at the same time, and, and, and I always have to remind myself this really happened, uh, she was what's called the president of the chambermaids. Yes, the chambermaids. They were the service arm of the Rockland Chamber because only men belonged to the chamber at that time. So they, um, she led the group that I think did all the hard work. Uh, at the same time, my, my father-in-law, uh, his family stopped and worked in the fields in Rockland for two years. So she, he came here when he was two years old. He had a sixth grade education. And he led the city of Rockland. He served on the council for 20 years, starting in 1948. While also being a welder at Aerojet, he opened up several small businesses and was a landowner uh, or a, a property um, owner and commercial businesses. And we've continued. Um, we've run small businesses here in Rockland ever since that time. My, my mother-in-law, I have to say, was born in her family home on Pacific Street. And 94 years later, she died in her family home on Pacific Street. So we haven't gone too far. What's changed is Rockland. We've gone from 500 people when they got here to a little over 70,000 now. We totally value, and it was really helpful today to listen about tradable sectors. Our businesses like the restaurant and the laundromat survived because of these tradable sector businesses that were here. And I think more than ever, I think the thing we know is we are a region. Um, something unique that we just did recently and I, and I know it was the first for, for our, my female leadership friends. Um, myself as the mayor of Rockland, Krista Bernasconi as the mayor of Roseville, and Alyssa Silhai, the mayor of Lincoln. We did our first joint mayor's forum last month, and we did it online. Um, having three women, quite frankly, leading the largest cities in Placer County is uh, something to be proud of and very unique. But we really talked about it, and it's exactly what we're doing with, with GSEC. I know that when Roseville does well, Rockland will do well. I know that I benefit when Lincoln does well. 
don't think there's not healthy competition. There is, and I plan that Rockland's always going to win because we're just better than the rest of them, but we're going to work together. We are a team, and I think that's the piece that we've learned from this. Um, I think just as we talked about today with our region being a team and the economy knowing no boundaries, COVID didn't know any boundaries. It didn't stop at the Sacramento County line. And so what we do together um, or what we do has to be together. So I really appreciate, I know you guys know that because that's why you're on this call. That's why you're doing this class today. So I'm a little bit preaching to the choir. I am blessed to tell you just with Rockin to live in an incredible community. One of the things that you also talked about is keeping our talent here. Um, Rockland has three public high schools, um, Rockland High, Whitney High, and Delaro High that service our kids, and they are absolutely as high of top-notch schools as you can get. We're also blessed that we have William Jessup and we have Sierra College. Sierra College is a junior college that has the highest percentage of kids that go on to get a bachelor's degree come from Sierra College. One of the things, my, my husband was the principal at Delaro, retired last year. And one of the things he says at graduation every year, go out, go to college, go to someplace different, get those great experiences, and then come back. When you're ready to start your family, come back. And I think that's what we talked a little bit about today too with our graduates. Let's get out there and get that experience, but then come back and get the same wonderful grow, growing experience that you had um, we've got in Rockland is 20 square miles and I have 37 parks right now. Everybody can walk to a park from their home. We are recognized as one of the safest communities in the California and we've been recognized nationally as one of the best places to live in, in the, the U.S. And that is because we have such a, it's a still feels like a small community, even though we've grown. I know we all have challenges. I know you know we all have challenges and that's why we're doing this today. We've got challenges, but we need to make our region a force and we will all benefit. I can't wait to see what happens with Aggie Square because I guarantee you Rockland will benefit from Aggie Square. Um, we're excited that uh, you probably saw that recently UC Davis is looking to put a presence um, in Rockland. And people say, well, does that really bring a lot to your community? You bet it does. They might not be going to give me a zillion tax dollars, but we're going to have great jobs there. And those people are going to live in Rockland. Why wouldn't you? You've got the best you can offer there. So um, I'm excited about this. I appreciate you all getting us fired up today. If you have anything you missed, you know it's on recording and, and GSAC staff will get that to you as well. But I think the message I get today is we're fortunate that we live in one of the best places you possibly could. And let's do this. Awesome. Thank you. Let us know how we can help everybody. Thank you for coming today. Thank you, everybody.